Um, Mr. Bascombe, could you please give a nice big Fletch clap? Fletch clap, here we go. Fletch clap. <laughs> <laughs> Are we going live in five, four, three, two, one? Hi guys, and welcome to Geek Talk, where we talk deep and geek about pianos, keyboard synthesizers, and music production and everything related to that. And it's a dream come true for us all today. My special guest, Mr. Dave Bascombe. Hello. Dave, nice. how are you, sir? Very good, nice to meet you. Yes, absolutely. Um, Dave, thank you so much for agreeing to see us. Pleasure. Now guys, um, you know we're gonna be interviewing Dave about the Music for the Masses um, album which he produced. There are so many things he's done, but we're gonna focus today exclusively on mus Music for the Masses. But now for this episode of Geek Talk, um, why I want to sort of separate them, Dave, I really want to find out more about you okay. because you are a little bit of a enigma. You know, for someone who's done as much as you've done, mm. obviously there is information about you on the internet, mm -hmm. but there is relatively not that much considering what you've done. That's interesting. Yeah. So, so, you know, and maybe that's because you're a very private person or whatever, but we really just want to get into who Mr. Dave Bascom well, I did is. a podcast the other day and someone said, you haven't got a website. And that was yeah. like the first stop place to go and try and find info. And I thought, sure. I've thought about it loads of times. I just mm -hmm. never thought, saw the point really. I mean, sure. I, it links to my various links to my management sure. site, which kind of says it all. And, sure. and it's just like, I don't know whether it's just laziness or I just think, mm -hmm. is it, what have I got to say on that? You know? So... Yeah, but also, I mean, I think well, there's a couple. There's a lot of reasons. I think. I mean, mainly I do mixing these days, which yeah. is perhaps not as, um, I mean, not as interesting as a production. You know, okay. uh, maybe. Um, so, other than that, I don't really know. Sure, yeah. sure. No, well, I suppose it's like um, there's that saying that people. It's probably just because you're so busy doing it, and you know, on this Geek Talk series, I have a lot of. Um, yeah, we have a lot of producers, up and coming producers, and there's a lot of obsessing about technical things. Mm. And I've always, I did, I put a, a video out a few weeks ago, which was called "Be Like the Pros," because the pros don't care. And what I'm talking about is, is it's people in your um, uh, position. I'm not saying you don't care, mm. but I find it's usually the the people who are sort of like coming into it, um, or even myself. We agonise about things. Of course. But when you're yeah. shadowing someone who's done yeah, great yeah, records, yeah. they're not obsessed by the well, details. Because you obviously need to know, you know. To, to learn all this stuff um, yeah. and then you sort of need to learn it to, to be able to forget it and not worry about yeah. it in a way and of course people are obsessed about it and I suppose did I when I started obviously the world was a different place when Absolutely. I started so I was just shadowing engineers and sure. learning by osmosis so but it is a question I mean I think it's really good to be limited by what you've got yes. instead of trying to get all the best gear you know and thinking oh, I can't make a record without that mm. Just, you know, get on, make the best of what you've got and you're going to come up with something much more original. But yeah, I mean, there's a thousand billion YouTube channels out there all going, mm. yeah, this is the secret of great mixing. Mm -hmm. Fuck off, you know, that's just <laughs> ridiculous. You know? I mean, yeah, but of course, you learn, I still learn, I watch them occasionally and I still mm. learn bits and pieces, mm -hmm. just different ways of looking mm -hmm. at things. But really, you've got to do it, you know, it's, it's putting the hours in. It's actually just doing it, getting down and doing it. And then occasionally you sort of, you know, not you might get stuck or you might just have a, Think I'm going to watch something different, and you go, yeah. Oh, yeah, I might try that and watch a few things. Tips, but they are sure. tips, they're not sure. you're not going to learn the meaning of life or how to make a great record by watching YouTube. That's right. And as, as I say, something I've learned is there are no hard and fast Absolutely. rules because there's, there's always someone who will come who will come and do things completely differently, yeah. and they'll yeah, you know, yeah. they'll do great things. Well, but obviously, we should really for the music for the masses thing, but I mean, there was mm. this they, their whole approach was completely different to anything I've done before, mm. and I, I'll talk about it a bit now, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, sure, and they sure. had a lot of kind of rules that I think. Would, you know, when you hear rules, you go, well, fuck that, I'm yeah, going to yeah. break them, you know. But they were kind of rules that, um, it was sort of like, they were light-hearted, unofficial rules, mm. uh, unspoken rules, really. But um, like no hi-hats, no presets. And never use the same sound twice. Yeah, you know, and like, it yeah. was it made a bloody effort. And now you're going to think, for God's sake, it's no ridiculous. But yeah. obviously, you know, the results speak for themselves because yeah. it, they did come up with it. It did force you to improvise and find different ways around it and come up with a unique approach and, and they were you know it's, it's interesting you say no hi-hats and the first thing that comes to mind and, and we'll go into detail when we talk about the masses is the behind the wheel what fascinated mm. me is this, it's kick snare kick snare and the fact that you don't have the symbols gives it kind of like a claustrophobic feel yeah, yeah. fast forward to the current albums yeah, 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 yeah. there's lots of symbols and hi-hats well actually I was thinking about because obviously I was thinking about the tracks this morning and actually I think there was a remix of behind the wheel mm. someone did it and it did have all the bog standard drum yeah. machine and hi-hats on it and I thought yeah. oh, why did they get away with that but yeah. and that came out as a single because obviously that's you know sometimes you do need something that the public can, can yeah. grab onto it's can, a familiar, yes, familiarity yes, yes, you know? yes. and uh, yeah uh, and it, 
it was an old little track that sure, I think sure. in terms of a single it probably needed a bit of mm, mm, yeah mm. more than nice. but that was yeah but I thought hang on we weren't allowed to use hi hats how come this they got away with it you know? <laughs> <laughs> so um Dave uh, as I say with my interviews I always like to just just talk I don't I don't like to be too rehearsed but obviously because of the the importance of this interview, um, I've written, a, ma sure. just made a few notes. Now, obviously, on this Geek Talk, we want to get to know you better. And if I can just say, I, um, I mean, do, I've been doing a Depeche Mode album review series. I've just finished all the Black Celebration albums. I did get in touch with um, Gareth Jones recently, and I was surprised he came back to me. It's because very often people don't reply. Sure. He replied within three hours. He was very gracious. He's a lovely he, man. He, and he just said, Vaughn, I wish you all the best, but I've said all I'm going right. to say about Depeche Mode. Mm -hmm. And then, Dave, I thought to myself, but if I do interview Gareth Jones, I don't think I could actually ask him what we haven't heard already. Yeah, because mm. he's been so well documented. Yeah. You, however, mm. are very, the, the masses, um, it's a very mysterious album. Mm. It, as a, no, there is not much information on it. So we're going to mm. debunk a few of those myths in the next series. Shall sure. build the anticipation here. But in this episode of Geek Talk, Dave, I'd like to know about, we all know about you, your background. How did you get into music production? How well, did it start for you? Um, Playing in a band, okay. left school at 17, bumming around, not knowing what I wanted to do. Mm. And um, literally, the bass player in the band saw an advert mm -hmm. in Melody Maker, okay. I remember that, saying Junior wanted for a London studio. So um, I thought I'll go along, have a look at this. Mm -hmm. Really not that interested in it. Mm. And um, it's just so lucky because I know, and now I know that, you know, they have a, the studios have hundreds of letters a week. Mm. But begging for, you know, uh, unpaid internships yeah. and stuff, which didn't exist. Luckily, I mean, anyway, so I got the job somehow and um i thought well this will do for a while before mm. i become a rock star <laughs> i mean it was ridiculous. so uh and you know but it was at a bar had some nice girls working there you muck around with the gear and hang mm. on and stuff um so anyway obviously it came to the point of the crunch of doing overtime there or rehearsing with the band and obviously i made the right choice because i stuck with the studio um and that was um yeah, 1977 i think mm -hmm. uh but i out of the three assistants, I was the last one in, but I was the only one that actually had made demos, uh, well, a, demo, a couple of demos, 16 track demos. So I had been in studios before, and I was possibly more musical than the other guys. I mean, the other guys had you know, lots of ideas, but I actually was a keyboard player. And so, oh, you were keyboard? Yeah, player, but yeah. You know, pretty crap, but um, <laughs> you know. But I did, so I was, anyway, what, what I was gonna go on to say was they were great about letting you have dead studio time, weekends mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I used to get mates bands in, just to kind okay. of practice really, and then, um, I inevitably ended up producing it because it was kind of rudderless, you know. Yeah, someone, yeah, yeah. If you wanted to get it done, so and I was quite a bossy little bloke there, you know. And they were getting a free demo out of it, so oh, I'd tell okay. them what what to do. And um, so eventually, yeah, this is becoming my life story. But I, I did one thing and sent it off to some record companies. And um, one guy came back and said, "Look, we don't particularly like the band, but we like the, the sound of it." Okay. And, uh, do you want to do some freelance engineering? Oh, so, wow. And I was still a T-boy, basically. So, uh, wow. And it was an Iron Maiden gig. <laughs> really? <laughs> Record the gig and mix it. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I remember. And the, uh, anyway, the day and our guy said, just, I had no idea what to charge. He said, charge the same as the musicians. Which I think it was 150 quid a day. Okay. It's about then. It was like, amazing. And yeah, I, yeah, I remember yeah. I got the receptionist to type the invoice up. And my boss walked past and saw it. And he was like, that's more than I get. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I went on. So I was kind of, I was just always, Mm. doing stuff you know like that yeah and just building up contacts and i think i think that's the story of a lot of people is is um uh, most great engineers started off wanting to be a rock star or a pop yeah, star yeah. and then by default um got into music but do, do you think that kind of suits your well stupid question it obviously suit it suits better to what you're doing what you, the, yeah what, what ended up doing you mean, it's, it's quite well it's quite funny because you said you were quite bossy and you you mm. don't strike me like that but Arrogance of youth, really. Arrogance yeah, of youth. Yeah, yeah. And also because they, they were getting it free. So, you know, oh, I see. Uh, it's different, totally different from when you're yeah. working with Depeche Mode, for example. I'm sure, I'm sure. No, that's that's that, that, that's great. So, uh, what was what was the first sort of success you had as a producer? Producer? Um, well, I've done quite a few bits and pieces, but the one I always quote, really, is the one that was um, the first kind of hit I had as a producer where I could put my stamp mm. on. It was a yeah. track called Mary's Prayer by Danny Wilson. Okay. Which I think was about 1986. Um, and I'd done the Tears for Fears by then, so I was getting quite a lot of work offers. Um, but that was the one where they'd actually gone and done the album with someone else, and um, the main single, the, the obvious single, hadn't really worked out. I see. They asked me to do I did quite a few, I reproduced a few tracks on the album, but Mary's Prayer was one of them. And it was a hit, so uh, that was um, that was the first hit as a producer, which was hugely mm. exciting. Sure. Um, first hit as an engineer, I mean, well, I did a few things going in sort of order. Um, 
I was asked to do I was asked to do the Nick and the Bunnyman album or finish it, finish okay. do some, record some tracks, do some overdubs and mix it. And then I remember I was um finished that as a freelance, mm -hmm. um, a guy to Liverpool. And then I came back and I was wait, making the tea on Wham, Young Guns. <laughs> and I thought, I've really got to change this, you know. Um, but it's, you know, it took a while. It took a long time to get mm. enough mm. going under my, you know, under myself to be full-time engineer. Um, so anyway, I'd done the Bunnyman stuff, but I'd lost touch with them. I hadn't really mm. um, kept in touch. So then I started, I did a, a couple of years later, I did a, a band called H2O, mm -hmm. which I was in, just the engineer. But they were my age, they were Scottish guys, got on really well. I used to hang out with them at the Columbia, which I was talking sure. about earlier on. And their first single went, was well on top of the pop. So we all went down. Okay. My first time there, their first time. So that was the buzz, you know, that mm. as a 22-year-old as or something. It was, yeah. just, it was so exciting. <laughs> sure. you know? um, so that's, that's the first kind of thing as an engineer. Yeah. That's my first hit, I think, of, even though mm. some of the Bunnyman stuff had been hits mm. with Dodge mm. Engineer, but mm. um, I hadn't been part of the, the process as it was going on. You know? sure. And we're still making the album. So as with Depeche sometimes, we, we, we put a single out and um, you still be making the rest of the album. So I, I was part of watching the process of the PR and them going off to make yes. videos, do TVs and stuff like that, which, because it's great. I mean, you are, with the period of making an album, mm -hmm. however long it is, you are part of the band, of effectively. Course. Course. And I love it. It's a great period. You know, it's mm. quite sad when it ends and they're mm. off doing their thing. Mm. I mean, it's nice because I'm getting to do something fresh, whereas sure. they're going out just to trot over the same old the songs, same. you know, yeah, and, yeah. and do the other, you know, the live stuff is obviously completely different. Mm. Um, and it is weird because you do feel, you know, you're out, Yes, you're living with each other, you're going out clubbing, sure. eating with everyone. So you are really part of this little unit. And, yeah. and suddenly the day it's over, they're off, you know, yeah, and you, yeah. you bump into them now and again. But uh, yeah. it's, it's yeah. odd. Yeah. So it really is the snowball effect of having success and then your phone just never stops ringing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but I mean, certainly the big break for me was the Tears for Fears. Yes. Um, without a shadow of a doubt. So um, it was really through having done um, Echo and the Bunnyman and a few other things for the pretty much for the same guy, a guy called Max Holt, who was at uh, WA Records. Mm. And um, he managed Chris Hughes, who was Tears of Fears producer. Oh, yes. yes. So they, they'd had a change of uh, guys uh, producing team, and they were in the studio basically, cut a long story short, without an engineer. So I was at home that day. Mm. God knows where I'd be if I wasn't. But I was okay. at home, and Max called me and said, can you get to the studio to work with Tears of Fears? Oh, I see. I mean, I was a huge fan. So, so that was the, that was the, that was, like a pivotal moment for you. That absolutely, really, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh yes, we, we could be here all day. There's so many fascinating stories here. Um, okay, <coughs> now I just want to ask you a few geeky questions, Dave. Now let, let's talk about music technology and how do you think music technology has affected the industry and how, how has it changed the way you work? Well, massive question. I mean, yeah. it's just unrecognizable from when I started completely, yeah. you know. But, you know, at the end of the day, we're still making our records. You've still got to do the same ingredients, you know, Correct. drums, bass, and vocals. Yeah. But it was, okay, what was great, and I loved about the 80s, was all the new technology coming out. Yes. And the potential was great. I loved drum yeah. machines. I thought drummers were boring as hell. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I wasn't, and um, all the records I was making were just incredibly dull. So as soon as I saw my first drum machine, I thought, this is so great. And, and you can, can, you've got more control. Yeah, no mucking about with yeah. Temperamental, you know, <laughs> out of time. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> anyway, so I was totally a fan of all that stuff. But as bits and pieces of technology came on, we, we you could easily see what could be achieved. But it was such a pain to do it. Mm. I mean, everything trying. And of course, there's a, there's a, everyone will tell you who was around then stuff you could do now in five seconds in Pro Tools just took forever. You know? And so, hence some of the records I worked on took forever because you were trying. You know, it was just painfully slow. Um, but it was still exciting because it was new, you know. So yeah, um, uh, yeah. But in terms of how we work now, as I say, it's limitations. So when you were limited to just a twenty-four track, mm. and when you were limited to a real drummer, you mm. had to work hard to get him in time. Exactly. And edit and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. It, was, it was hard work. But <clears throat> if you like records from that period, which I do a lot of them, yeah, it shows. You know, it's, mm. it's, it's got a quality that you'll never get these days. This is true. And a lot of people go on about the medium, and it's that it's, it's digital. Which yeah. is, that's just a bloody myth. It's a yeah. total myth, and it just Thank drives you. me nuts. Thank because you. it's not it's the process. Yes. Once it's in tools, you know, you could do it on a 16 track analog machine. Mm. If you keep to that brief, if, and some people do, mm. fantastic. Mm. You know, it's mm. it's that discipline is marvellous. Yeah. But mm. Um, mm. once it's in there, in the, in the, in the Pro Tools, it, yeah. you can't help but manipulate it. Or it's very hard not to, you know. Once you've got yeah. an auto tune for one word, you just leave it on for the whole thing and see how it sounds. And you go, well, that's all right, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and then it suddenly, you got auto tune vocal. I know some people stay away from that a lot, but mm. Um, mm. inevitably, the public become used to the hearing that. You know? yes, and um, yes. in the way that they're, I mean, the great thing about modern pop, I think, is 
the, the bottom end is make, becoming more and more oh, apparent. I think. So fat. Uh, yeah. Uh, modern love, records are I so fat. That, yeah. 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 And um, I think it's because you don't have the limitations of vinyl, which is ironic. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, this is true, yeah. And, well, I'm, uh, there was obviously CDs for years, so I don't really know why that's happening. Well, I think it's just people are becoming more... The club thing is crossing over more and more. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if you listen to pop music up until about the 90s, and then you had always like dance versions. Yeah. If you listen to mainstream pop these days, which I don't, yeah. it is fundamentally just dance Absolutely. music. Absolutely. It is, and it's Absolutely. And that's what people are so tuned into. That's mm. the norm, you know. So, and uh, But that interesting, and that's, I think Flood talked about this once, but... Um, it was disco that arguably started the whole modern world of, of sound, I think, because up to then drums weren't really that important. Of course they were important, mm. but it was the whole thing, you know, and the yeah. drums were like an almost, almost percussion. Thing, sure, you know? sure. And so once the emphasis on the beat started, mm. to fall on the floor, and of course drum, when drum machines came along, that was suddenly instantly easier, solid, yeah. you know, for all the, solid, solid, all the reason yeah. I've just yeah, said. Yeah. Um, and then we've just, it's kind of carried on from there. And, you know, and everything you do now has to have some, well, not everything, but certainly most pop music, as you said, has to have some sort of element of beat in there that's, and that wasn't the case in the 70s, early 70s. Just, you know, yeah. Punk records, they weren't all about that. Yeah, just more about the aggression. Yeah, and the of getting... course, there are indie bands out there who still don't yeah. really focus on the beat, but the overall sound that you hear on the radio on virtually any channel is going to have some sort of yeah, so element. So... And that is certainly t a million times Mm. Easier with techn the mm. modern technology. In fact, really, the, the, that precision would obviously never have been possible until mm. machines came mm. out. Mm. But um, I think I think what we talk on my channel as well a lot with with, it, with it, the producers and stuff is is that the abundance of technology that we have access to. Yeah. I, I suppose there's a good side. The good side is is that it's a lot more accessible. Yes. The bad side with that is everyone's, everyone's doing, doing it, it. so yeah, there's yeah. more noise. So to, to try and stand. Of course. Up. But I always when I'm coaching people because I, I coach people as well and I always. And, but the funny thing is, David, I'll probably lose some clients now. I coach people, but I never follow my own rules when I'm in the studio. <laughs> because what I always say to people is, do what the guys, let's go to Trevor Horn, and maybe you can help uh, dispel a myth here. Like, relax. Now, apparently that said that was 24s. I don't, 24 tracks. I believe there was probably bounces and stuff. Yeah. But I think um, what I'm trying to ask you here is, it is that limitation mm. and that necessity being the mother of invention, yeah. which we don't have anymore. Yeah. So we don't. But I'll say with relax. Ourselves. I bet they wish they did have more facility, you know, but uh, that, right. everyone knows what a torturous process that was. And um, well, that was a classic example of technology on the cusp. Mm. So they were trying to do stuff that was incredibly difficult mm. technically. And uh, if they had more tracks, you know, yeah. if they had the Pro Tools, they would have, you know, they could have done what they wanted to do sure. in, in, in minutes. But sure. what the results would have been, who knows? You know, you can't say because... Yeah. So, yeah, you, but you that's, that's all you had. So it wasn't a question of, like, you didn't think, oh, God, you could, didn't envisage a time mm. when you'd be able to... Well, actually, I did a bit, a little bit. I thought one day you'd be able to chop all the drums up individually. Yeah. And it was like a pipe dream, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, I, I can't remember what your point was about that. No, 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 I, th I think no, you, you've answered the question. It was just really about the notion of limitation. And yeah. I think also the younger producers, guys who are like getting into it now, they've got no idea of, of, of what, when I say that, they don't know the struggles. So yes. when someone like yourself does something, like even if you do something as simple as, let's say, reverse a, a symbol, yeah, yeah. whereas in the days you'd have to take the machine, you'd have yeah. to take the tape and turn yeah, it yeah. around. Um, and you more importantly than that, you have to remember which bloody track is supposed yes. to be because 17 becomes yes. track 9 is it? Or yeah so uh, cry, yeah. obviously crying out for yeah, four cups so what I'm saying is you, you obviously have a, a, a much better appreciation for the technology because you know yeah. you'll do something and you knew how, how yeah. hard it would have yeah. been yeah. in the 80s and stuff